Good evening. Welcome to our Kepler's Literary Foundation events. I'm Angie Coiro, event host and producer for the foundation. We're about to have an intriguing, important discussion about how our country works or doesn't work and propose fixes that go to the very structure of our constitution. First, a little bit of business, including how you can participate in the conversation. About us, the Kepler's Literary Foundation is partnered Kepler's Books in Menlo Park, California. Our mission is to engage, enrich, and inspire our community. We produce interviews, book club, and literary workshops, and events for children and young adults, including students in Title I schools. You may have attended programming at large community venues with us or at Kepler's Books itself. We are carrying that mission to this online space. Visit keplers.org and check out Refresh the Page. It's our online event schedule, Refresh the Page. And you can sign up for our newsletter while you're there. Kepler's Literary Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Times are hard all around, especially for community members and for arts organizations. So I wanna thank all of you who have already donated in support of tonight's event when you signed up. Thank you for that. If you'd like to help us continue our work at the foundation, there is a donate button at keplers.org. Now to our topic, there was a chilling exchange at a White House press conference today. A reporter asked Donald Trump's press secretary, is the president saying if he doesn't win this election, he will not accept the results? And she responded, the president has always said he'll see what happens and make a determination in the aftermath. And this is adding to concerns that if he loses, he may not want to relinquish the White House. A strongman president elected in a populist uprising is not bound to the normal conventions of politics. So that's from our two guests tonight. The idea of what's normal needs to be examined in its own light. Normally, laws are drafted in Congress and sent to the president for signature. What if that were a two-way street? What if that were to change? What if the president could propose legislation for Congress to approve? William Howell is chair of the Department of Political Science at the University of Chicago. He is the Sidney Stein Professor in American Politics at the university's Harris School of Public Policy. William, hello. Hi there. Good to be with you, Angie. Thank you. And Terry Moore is at Stan Terry Mo, pardon me, Terry, is at Stanford <laughs> University, where he is the William Bennett Monroe Professor of Political Science and a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. So together, these two have created an audacious proposal. What if we looked at the reality of quote unquote normal politics, deadlocked, partisan, vulnerable to the worst of populist instincts, and literally rejiggered the constitution? Their book is Presidents, Populism, and the Crisis of Democracy. Can't wait to have this conversation and you are welcome to be part of it. You can submit your questions, look on your screen for the Q&A button, click that, type in your question on the screen, and keep them, please, concise and to the point. I wanna to get to as many of those as I can. If you need to reach a Kepler's team member for any kind of support, use the chat button for that. Click on chat, type your question in, and our event support team will reach out to you. Okay, so that's the Q&A button to send me questions and the chat button to reach the team for other issues. One more small thing, Terry and I are both on the San Francisco Peninsula where we are under threat of rolling blackouts tonight. So if one or both of us suddenly disappears, William gets to carry the ball. No pressure, William, just to let you know. <laughs> All right. So let's get started. Uh, we're going to start, in fact, with the word populist. It's going to come up a lot tonight. The dictionary definition is someone who champions people who feel disenfranchised against a perceived elite. And you guys are focusing on the dark side of that. Tara, you want to tackle that? Sure. Um, no, uh, the Athenians were aware that democracy contains the seeds of its own destruction. And the reason is that when things don't go right, when people become angry and disaffected with the system, they become susceptible to a populist demagogue. And a populist demagogue then uh, uh, leads them in an attack against the system. Well, the system is a democratic system. Mm -hmm. And um, that happened a number of times in Athens. And it's happened in the United States. It's happened in Europe. It's happened in Latin America. It's the kind of thing that happens when people become angry and anti-system and susceptible to leaders who attack democratic institutions, who undermine the rule of law, and who 
offer them up as strong men, that they are the strong men mm -hmm. who will um, take action that circumvents the, all the cumbersome democratic procedures to get things done. And the problem with it is that it's ultimately anti-democratic and dangerous and threatens to bring the system down. And that's what's happened historically across the world. And unfortunately, it's the kind of thing that's happening in the United States now. Uh, William, four years ago, a lot of people were laughing at the idea of Donald Trump being president, but it was the populists that put him in the White House. How did that work? Well, um, Trump played by the populist playbook. What he did is he stepped forward and said, you know, our system is broken. It's rigged. It is, um, it is, it is just sort of nothing but wreckage. And he presented himself as an outsider, right? As somebody who stood apart from that wreckage and would deliver uh, on the promise, on a set of promises to a set of people who were disaffected and angry, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's in this way, you see both Trump rising from this anger and disaffection uh, in a way that then is, is not born of kind of a democratic revival. It's a critique of democracy. It's a saying, look, the system, this democratic system has failed you. Look to me, I'll deliver for you, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's what he promised. I mean, he's quite explicitly. And then I think an important thing to note is that having offered a critique of the democratic order in totally sweeping language, right? That's meant to delegitimize it. That's meant to, there isn't then a turn towards constructive action. There isn't just, you know, the, the populace doesn't then roll up her sleeves or his sleeves and say, now let's get to work and let's set things right and reconstitute the political order so that the voices of people who've been disenfranchised, who haven't been heard, who are upset, find a voice in this new democratic um, uh, order. Rather, what the populace does and is what Trump has done is simply continue to sow that disaffection, right? Mm -hmm. To, to, um, to, to turn anger into fury. Um, and it's that kind of um, oppositional posture that the, that the, that the, the populace assumes that is, his ticket to power is something that he maintains while in power. Well, let's talk about what is and isn't the, the, uh, the topic of your book. Trump figures heavily in the book, and of course he does, because it's the example that's in our face right now. But you're both careful to say that just because he gets in place, taking heart from him having a replacement would be an exercise in denial, that switching out presidents doesn't make a big difference in a broken system. Yeah, I, I think um, what people do is they focus on Trump as the cause of our crisis of democracy. I mean, we're in a real crisis of democracy, but Trump isn't the main cause of it. Uh, he's a proximate cause, um, but there are these enormous worldwide socioeconomic forces, globalization, uh, technological change, immigration, uh, that are imposing economic costs and leading to cultural anxieties among millions of Americans. And uh, these are uh, very, very serious problems that our government has done a very ineffective job of dealing with. And that's what's led to this populist uprising among Americans and uh, these anti-system uh, uh, feelings that have allowed them to vote for a strong man mm -hmm. who engages in anti-democratic actions. And so ultimately, if Trump were to uh, lose in the 2020 election uh, or if he moves out of office in 2024, um, those forces will still be there. We'll still have globalization. We'll still have technological change. There will still be people who are very angry with the system and there will be other populist leaders who come along and take advantage of those conditions, right? To build an anti-system movement and to take up where Trump has left off. And so we can't just focus on Trump. We have to see this as part of a much larger problem. It's a problem of essentially effective government People are angry at a system that doesn't work. And so the job of the Democrats, if they beat Trump, is not just to like do what Democrats normally do. They need to build an effective government 
that can meet the needs of people. And that requires not just providing programs, which tend to be ineffective, but to build a government that has the capacity for effective performance. And that requires fundamental institutional reforms. Well, if I, William, let me pick out an example that, that Terry just brought up, the example of immigration immigration reform, dealing with the problems of immigration. Now, we've seen immigration increase all over the world, and we've seen problems in multiple countries, but there are examples in the book of how a healthier political system can deal with a problem even as big as that. So compare and contrast how the U.S. has dealt with it and how a more successful system has dealt with it. Well, just as these, you know, global forces that are weighing upon and challenging democratic systems um, are having an effect domestically and laying the groundwork for something like Trump to rise to power, you see the same global forces working in other countries. And I think what we see in the last five years is you saw a huge population movement um, in, uh, in Europe, wherein a set of countries felt like they were sort of overrun, right? They didn't meet that particular challenge and provide a kind of orderly, effort to attend to the, um, the perceived threat that many people saw. And it's in precisely those moments that the political fortunes, the electoral fortunes of populist parties rose in Europe. Um, what you then saw, though, was that in a number of countries in Europe, they gathered themselves and were able to provide a more effective response. Um, and that's not something that our system is especially adept at attending to, that we haven't delivered on. What you see over the last 30 years is a huge uh, uh, increase in levels of uh, immigration and, um, and the number of undocumented residents within the country that have created some, that, look, they're in the main, the big effects of immigration, there are lots of effects that are salutary. I mean, there's reasons to actually be fans of immigration, um, but they also come with costs, and some, of the, and some of those costs are borne by specific individuals and specific communities. And unless you have a government that attends to those, that, that fallout in a thoughtful, serious-minded way, what you're going to get is uh, kind of, as Terry notes, kind of this, this uh, both anxiety and anger, which then can quickly be racialized and can be weaponized. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we've seen. Um, and so while there have been huge changes in immigration flows within the, the United States, um, we still don't have a comprehensive immigration system, right? We still don't have a comprehensive immigration reform. And this is important to note, Trump hasn't delivered it either. I mean, this goes back to this, this basic point. He, he runs by tapping into people's angers and disaffection with a political order that is broken. And his leading piece of evidence, right? Exhibit A is immigration. Um, and so he's sowing and, 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 and pushing off from that anger and disaffection, but he, isn't, he doesn't then set to work on fixing it, right? He doesn't then say, all right, well, here's what an a comprehensive immigration reform is gonna look like, and let's fix that problem, right? What right. he does is continue to sow that anger and, uh, and to foment that outrage. Um, and in that sense, right, what, what the, the, the worry is that in the aftermath of Trump, it isn't just that the anger caused by independently those global forces um, is, is going to persist. It's also that those flames have been, well, those embers have been blown on and, they've, and, and the flames have grown under, under Trump's leadership. Well, Bindu from the audience has a question about the anger. He said the economy was in recovery after the Bush uh, regime. Things appeared to be on track with an inclusive leadership under Obama. So what happened to bring up all that anger and resentment toward the system, which seemed to be working? Well, you know, this is a long-term development. Uh, globalization began uh, basically in the late 70s and 1980s. And its effects have accumulated over time as, as people have lost jobs, uh, especially less educated white people have lost jobs. Uh, we've had a hollowing out of manufacturing, uh, a decline in economic growth, um, of the decimation of communities. Um, the harms have just accumulated over time. Um, also, the cultural anxieties that have gone along with an immigration system, especially, that just can't get fixed because our political system is incapable of fixing it. Yeah. Right? And, and these things add up. And then there's the fact that we had a black president. And that fact, this is just the truth of the matter, caused 
a great many less educated white people to move uh, disproportionately into the Republican Party. And so um, that's another cultural factor that was huge. And really, there was just all of this anger that had been building up uh, in rural communities among a section of the white people in this country. Uh, and the established Republicans were above it all. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you had the Paul Ryans of the world, John McCain, uh, uh, Mitt Romney, right? They're marching to a different drummer. And Trump was the only one that saw this underlying simmering populist anger that he could take advantage of. And once he did, it was just explosive, right? It was there uh, growing over time. And it was in 2016 that it really burst forward. And he was in a position to do so as the outsider, right? And all of his inexperience, the things that looked like political liabilities. In fact, when making these appeals were assets because you could say, look, I've, I have nothing to do with that mess there, right? And Clinton, you have all this experience, but it's the wrong experience. I'm the one who will speak truth to and about this wreckage. And I'm the one who can deliver you from it, right? That was, that was the appeal and it resonated. I think one thing to note though, is that we're not making like a deterministic argument. It's that, look, that those forces were in play in 2016. They're gonna to continue to be in play. And this is precisely why the worry is something that's gonna persist after Trump leaves power. This, mm -hmm. this, this, these folks um, can be, I mean, their anger can be harnessed again. Um, well, you know, let, let's talk about what we all learned in social studies or civics class, depending on our age. And that was that we have this beautiful construction of checks and balances. And we've been focusing a lot on the president, but here's the Congress that's supposed to be a balance on all of that. And, and here's this explosive sentence that you have from the book. Congress, no matter the need, no matter the circumstance, simply is not up to the task of solving modern problems. I'll let either of you explain why that is. It's a big Congress. There's a lot that could get done. Why are they incapable? Well, I, either one of us could do this, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll, I'll start and William can uh, finish up uh, if he likes. Uh, look, Congress uh, consists of two houses and 535 people. Uh, they're from different states and uh, different districts. And uh, they care about themselves and their political careers. And they are not motivated by providing coherent, intellectually well-justified, workable solutions to national problems. That is not what gets them reelected. Right? They are not held accountable for that. Mm -hmm. right? if, if they enact legislation that doesn't work, it's not their fault. They don't uh, get credit for uh, uh, legislation that does work, and they don't get blamed for legislation that doesn't work. Presidents do. So presidents are the ones that are obsessively worried about their legacies. Right? And, and their legacies turn on the kind of job they do at taking on the most important national problems and solving them. Members of Congress are motivated in a completely different way and then there are 535 of them. So institutionally, it's just a mess. Plus uh, with two houses of Congress and all these committees and two parties, uh, they can barely get anything done, right? So if, if, and also when they make legislation, it's okay, you get yours and I get mine and they cobble together something that will hopefully pass, right? Will it solve? A national problem, who cares, right? It's something that can get passed. So if you look at what they did with the, ta with the tax legislation under Trump or uh, with their attempt to put together uh, a new healthcare package, it's, it's almost funny what they did. There's nothing coherent about it. These are not coherent national policies that are gonna really move the nation forward and solve problems. Congress does a terrible job of that. And actually, Congress always has done a terrible job of that. It's just worse now than it ever was before. Well, William, one of the points in the book is that each congressional member is beholden to their own constituency and to special interests. What if you were to subtract the special interests? What if you were to get the money? We hear this all the time. Get the money out of politics. Let them be, as is appropriate, responsive to their constituents. I mean, how far would that go as a fix? Well, it's hard to do. I mean, because at base, you have 
people who are serving within Congress who have to get reelected in the House every two years by securing um, uh, support within their home district. And in order to secure home within the home district, you have to attend to powerful interests within that home district. Um, and so the idea that we can put up kind of hard guardrails that will keep the money out when, look, organized interests have sort of, a, there's an open door there because legislators need to court their approval so that they can secure their reelection every two years. And so at every turn, they're paying attention to how policy affects their constituents back home. They're not thinking about the whole, right? They're not thinking about what is systemic, comprehensive immigration reform look like. They're thinking, well, if we roll out this bill, what implications is it going to have for this organized interest back home or this subset of my constituents back home? And then they're going to fight like hell to ensure that those interests are accommodated. That's one person at a time. And then when you have 535 voting members, what you get is one of two brands of dysfunction, right? One is nothing gets done at all because you're at loggerheads and you're stuck with gridlock, no, the lack of immigration reform or the lack of serious minded uh, movement on something like climate change. Or mm -hmm. where you do get action, you get these cobbled together, unbelievably complex, incoherent, um, massive sort of monstrosities that are filled with carve-outs and exceptions for every organized interest. And that is born of a system that at root attends to local interests, not because money has poured into the system, but by institutional design, because we have a Congress wherein legislators have to seek support every two years uh, to their members back home. I don't want to get into too many examples because it's easy to get into the weeds, but Terry, I think one of the, one of the most illustrative examples that's in the book is what happened to the 1986 Tax Act, which you commend as you know having been a good, honest effort that was conceived and thought through and actually pondered before it got thrown out into the arena. But since then, 15,000 addenda have been put into that. That seems like just such a clear picture of how badly wrong things can go. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, uh... This was during the Reagan era, and uh, uh, both uh, the Reagan administration and Congress recognized that the, the tax code was this god-awful thing that had thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, loopholes and carve-outs written into it, and it didn't in any way represent a coherent policy for the nation. And so uh, uh, in an effort to actually do something good for the country, they decided to revise the whole thing right, and get rid of almost all those loopholes, which they did. It was an amazing achievement. Mm -hmm. um, but then, over the next 20 years, Congress did what it always does. It slowly but surely began adding the loopholes back in, and by 2005, a study of the tax code showed that they had added 15,000 additional loopholes to this beautiful reform that they did in 1986. Loopholes. Yeah, and each of those loopholes was a, was a win for a legislator or a group of legislators. They were doing their job. This is not like Congress losing its way. It's about legislators behaving as political entrepreneurs and attending to the interests uh, back home. Yeah, that's what Congress does. Well, let's, we, let's get into fixes. Let's get into some of your proposals as to how to make this right. But the last thing before that is to establish why it's really needed, especially the strengthening of the presidency. And the two examples that you use throughout the book are the progressive movement at the turn of the 1900s. And then later, of course, we had um, what happened with the New Deal. And here you have FDR essentially turning around a massive problem, setting up new programs, you know, getting the, uh, the country back to work. So why couldn't a president with current powers do the same thing, leave the constitution intact the way it is and get the right person in there to do the job? And I'll let either of you tackle that. I'll, I'll jump at this one first. How about Terry and you can-, you sure, can... No, go ahead. All right. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't, so I think this is where, um, you know, the consistent failure of our government not just during one administration, but across multiple administrations, Democratic and Republican alike, to gain traction on these big modern problems and attend to them in a way that alleviates 
the concerns and anxieties that citizens have and meets the expectations they have of government, mm -hmm. points towards something more than just our failure to elect the right kinds of people. Um, and this was a fact that was recognized during the progressive movement and in the New Deal, particularly in the progressive movement, wherein they said, look, the government that we inherited from our nation's founding isn't equipped to meet then the challenges of increasing rises of immigration and the industrial revolution and the emergence of the United States on the global stage. Like our system isn't structurally equipped to meet those kinds of challenges. And so what we need to do is rethink how we design our institutions. And they set to work on that in a, in a, in a serious and holistic way. Um, they routed out all kinds of corruption within the administrative state. They built the civil service. They also recognized that new powers needed to be given to the president because the president offers a kind of leadership that's in short supply in our national politics because presidents, be precisely, precisely because they represent a national constituency and they care about their legacy, are more likely to attend to the kind of systemic kind of coherence of policy that is trying to meet national challenges and then thinks about the long-term implications of those policy interventions. Um, and so, yeah, we, a thing that we call for in this book is something of a second progressive movement, not because we think that the progressive had it right, and not because this is an argument for big government. I mean, this example that you were talking about earlier about the 86 right, tax uh, reform and the ways in which the, in the years afterwards it was completely bastardized um, is, Right, a signal that an ineffective government is no friend of conservatives, right? Mm -hmm. This is not an argument about just expa expanding the arm and the reach of the state. It's about building institutions that are capable of meeting challenges that, that the public believes are the legitimate subject of government action. Um, and that we don't have, right? That we don't have, which requires institutional reforms. One last word, and then Terry, jump in, right? One last word, which is simply that, um, you know, basically the institutional architecture that we have today is the institutional architecture that we were, uh, that was built 240 years ago, when our nation consisted of 3.7 million farmers, 700,000 of whom were slaves, and the government wasn't expected to do much of anything and didn't do much of anything. And so it's no surprise that that architecture that was built then doesn't serve us well in this period now. Terry? Yeah, I think William covered a lot of ground there. Uh, so let, let me just uh, strip it down uh, to a few basics. Uh, uh, the starter is that uh, we have a constitution uh, that gave us a government, a particular design of government in 1787. It was designed by people who uh, built a government for that time, a very primitive time in which almost everyone was a farmer. There are only 4 million people. And so they didn't want a government that could do much and, and they built a government that couldn't do much. Mm -hmm. um, so they built a separation of power system with lots of checks and balances, fine. And uh, it was a, a government that served them well at that time. But then when the nation went through industrialization and urbanization and, and uh, uh, masses of uh, waves of immigration around the turn of the century, around 1900. Uh, and Congress uh, at the core of the government was corrupt and incapable of, of meeting the challenges of that time, the challenges of modernity. People began saying, hey, we need to modernize this government. It's 100 years old. It was designed for a bygone era. And that's where the progressive movement came from. Mm -hmm. And the reforms the progressives adopted, including civil service, gave us a presidentially led administrative state. That is a modern government. We didn't have a modern government until that time. However, it had to be grafted on to this constitutional structure that was basically almost impossible to change because mm -hmm. right? it's almost impossible to amend the constitution. So it was better, but we're still sort of limping along. And then, okay, so we're doing better. Then comes the Great Depression. All right, so Franklin Roosevelt sees that he has to do something to deal with these massive problems. He creates an American version of the modern welfare state with all of these new agencies 
right, in a much bigger government designed to actually provide people with services and to provide people with social security and other uh, basic safety nets, right? The markers of a modern society and also greater presidential power within the system, right? It's really been ever since then that our government has not been updated since. Meantime, things have changed dramatically. Right? Just the things that we talk about, globalization, right? immigration, technological change, right? society is massively changing. Our government is not changing. We, we still are stuck with this archaic structure. And that's why we say we need something like a second progressive movement to modernize this government, to streamline it, and to give us a suitable government for dealing with the problems of modern times. We are straitjacketed by a government that was designed by people who had no idea about the kind of world that we would be living in. We need a government for us, and we don't have one. Let's get into specifics then. One of the first things you introduce in the idea of a strengthened presidency is the idea of a universal fast-tracked authority, which is taking the president from the back end of legislation and putting him to the front end of legislation. William, what would that look like? Well, it gives the president formal agenda setting power. Um, this is not about increasing the president's unilateral powers. It's not about saying whatever the president says goes. Um, it's about allowing the president to put before Congress a bill that legislators then are forced to vote on. And if they fail to vote on it, it automatically becomes law. And there cannot be, there will not be a party leader who says, you know, come under my wing. This is a tough vote for you. I'm going to protect you. I won't bring that forward. Or I'll water down the bill in all sorts of ways that will make it more palatable to your organized interests back home. Um, it's an effort to try to leverage the kind of national long-term outlook that presidents stand to offer. So that's one way in which we want to expand presidential power. There are other ways in which we want to limit and restrict presidential power because we don't, our argument is not that all things good and great flow from the executive branch. Right. Our argument is, is that we have to think about how we leverage, responsibly leverage presidential leadership, but also recognizing that presidents can represent a very real threat to democracy. That's what we're observing now. And mm -hmm. so there are other kinds of reforms that we should talk about as well that, that curtail that threat, that put it in check so that we can, we can, we'll have a presidency for modern times that can effectively meet the challenges we face, but also reducing the kind of harm done by the kind of populist demagogue that we have uh, within office today. Terry, do you want to get into that fast track authority? Sure. Um, yeah, let, let me just add a few details to it uh, to make it clear. So, you know, we, have, we already have, have had fast track authority for over 40 years. Uh, on international trade agreements. It works great, right? There's no problem with it. It's not undemocratic. Uh, it's just a streamlined way of making sure that in, the, in that case, trade agreements don't get um, uh, torn apart and put back together again by Congress because they have to be negotiated and they can't, they can't do that if, if trade agreements are gonna pass. So basically members of Congress have to vote on the trade agreement that's been agreed to by the president and other nations, up or down, right? Mm -hmm. And what we're saying is let's apply that same model, which is a time-tested model, to everything, to all legislation. Now, why do we let the president design the policy proposals? Because the president, compared to all other national players, is the champion of effective government. Why? Because of their legacy. They care, they're obsessed with their legacies. They want to be great. They want to have their faces on Mount Rushmore, including Trump, right? And so what they're going to try to do is to craft legislation that works, that's coherent, that fits together, that makes sense. It's not something that Congress doesn't do. And then they send it down to Congress and Congress has to vote up or down. That means the House has to vote up or down. The Senate has to vote up or down. And they can vote no. They don't, you know, they don't have to accept it but mm -hmm. they have to vote on it. Right. And um, uh, they have to vote within a period of time, like 90 days, right? So there's nothing undemocratic about that. But for instance, um, with immigration, 
uh, there were three immigration bills that offered uh, comprehensive solutions to our immigration problem, two under uh, George W. Bush and one under uh, Obama. Um, the two Bush bills went, went down in the Senate uh, because of the filibuster. We don't allow filibusters, right? It has to be a majoritarian rule. Both those bills had enough votes to pass. Uh, the one under Obama uh, never even came up for a vote. Right. In the House because John Boehner exercised his agenda control and simply said he wasn't going to bring it up for a vote. There were enough votes in the House to pass the thing. We would have had immigration reform. Under fast track, he wouldn't be allowed to do that, right? They have to vote on it. And mm -hmm. so all we're saying is that, number one, you put the power to craft legislation in the hands of the, the one player who's a champion of effective government. And uh, two, we're streamlining the legislative process so that it's no longer pathological the way it is right now, but is uh, fast and efficient and where things can actually happen and we can get good legislation passed. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on to the uh, intelligence agencies and Department of Justice because you did say everything isn't a gift to the president. There's some giving and some taking away. So there's the idea of taking those intelligence agencies and the Department of Justice and making them less vulnerable to what the president wants. Yeah, there's the promise of presidential leadership and there's the fear and they're both in play. And so the challenge of institutional reform when you think about the presidency is not one of kind of plain vanilla moderation, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It's the challenge is to think, okay, presidents offer a certain kind of leadership. Um, and so let's try to leverage that fast track authority. But when certain kinds of things that presidents do, um, and certainly when they are a demagogue, uh, a populist demagogue in the way that Trump is, represents a profound threat to the rule of law and to our democracy. And there's nothing served in terms of effective government by allowing a president to meddle in the Justice Department. And there's all kinds of uh, concern that we should have that uh, an unscrupulous president will use that, uh, the powers of the Justice Department to prosecute his political enemies. Mm -hmm. and to protect his political friends. Um, and that's profoundly corrosive to our democracy. So we want to, I mean, our concern isn't about the presidency so much as it is about effective government and democracy. Um, and so th this is an instance where presidents, we think, have undue and excessive influence over the Justice Department and the intelligence agencies, and that they, uh, they, those, that kind of influence is a real threat when when, again, you have an unscrupulous populist president uh, occupying the White House. Mm -hmm. yeah, I should just add that, that ever since Watergate, uh, there have been strong norms about what presidents can do with regard to, say, the FBI or the rest of the Justice Department or the intelligence agencies. And uh, no president prior to Trump would have said, oh, I can do anything I want. You know, I can, I can fire Mueller. I can uh, simply get rid of these investigations that I, I don't like, investigations into myself or into my cronies, right? Um, and I can uh, get the Justice Department to take out after CNN or, or Amazon or anybody I want because I'm in charge. Okay, no president would have done that, but we have a president now who's doing that. And you can do it. That's a problem that you can get away with it right now. Well, it's unclear uh, under our legal system, but, but the courts are so fragmented and slow that we've been unable to get clear answers to the question of what's legal and what's not legal. But what's very clear is this is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know, William Barr is a believer in the theory of the unitary executive which is essentially that, that the president can do whatever he wants within the executive branch, right? And there are at least several uh, Supreme Court justices who adhere to this theory. And uh, the members of the Federalist Society who are increasingly being appointed to the courts believe in the theory of the unitary executive. This is very dangerous. And so what we're proposing is, uh, look, this is a dangerous theory. 
And what we need to do is to make certain components of the executive branch independent of presidential influence because they're too important, they're too powerful, they're too dangerous, and presidents can't be allowed to directly control them, right? So they need to be led by multi-member boards with, uh, uh, populated by members with, say, fixed staggered terms, something like that. Uh, we need that to safeguard our democracy. Uh, before we go on, Christy popped in an, an interesting question about our universal fast track authority. So I wanna back up to that very briefly. Mm -hmm. She asked, under the system that you're describing, is it correct to assume the bills could not be amended? That's what we have in mind, exactly. They have to vote on it on an up or down basis. And because the reason is because we don't want Congress to do what Congress does really well, which is just water down these bills and load them up with a bunch of lard and carve out an exceptions for organized interests, right? What we wanna do is leverage the kind of uh, vision that and the leadership that presidents stand to offer. Now, they, as Terry noted, they're free to vote it down. They're free to vote it down and then independently put forward their own alternative and vote on that. We're not shutting down the opportunities for Congress to independently legislate as they currently can. So in that sense, they can. But they first have to cast a vote against that which the president has put forward. They have to go on record saying, I'm not going to get behind that reform. Mm -hmm. Restricting presidential appointments. There are 3,500 positions right now that are presidential appointments, and the Congress only approves about a third of those. So you just blow them out? Look, I, I think Donald Trump has shown how dangerous it is when the executive branch is filled with extreme political partisans who are simply loyal to the president and who in many cases don't have the slightest idea about the substance of the policies they're dealing with. They're not experts, mm -hmm. right? And uh, this drags down the effectiveness of the entire government. Um, it's also very dangerous because you get people um, in the executive branch who are willing to use the power of these executive agencies to do the president's bidding. Right? Th this is not what effective government is about. If you look at um, Britain or look at almost any other country in Western Europe, uh, they have very, very few political appointees. Their bureaucracies are made up of career experts. And only at the top do you have political appointees. So they provide guidance, but almost everything else is carried out by career civil servants. There is no reason why we can't do that in this country. And if we did do it, we would have a much more professional expert bureaucracy that would be far more effective than the bureaucracy we have now. We had a good handful of people asking about the Electoral College, about the elimination of the Electoral College. Does that figure into the picture here? No, but it, except in one way. I mean, basically, no, there are lots of reasons to be against the Electoral College. We are no fan of the Electoral College yeah. and there are concerns about its kind of corruption of democracy, the direct effect that it has. Um, uh, but the idea that if we keep everything constant, but just get rid of the Electoral College and we carry on our way, that then we'll have a more effective government, right? Mm -hmm. That does not follow. Like if what you want to do is push back against populism, what you need are a set of institutional structures that are capable of meeting modern challenges and eliminating the electoral college will not do that. Now, there's one sort of corollary to that, which is that because of the electoral college, in certain moments, in certain policy domains, presidents have incentives to give disproportionate attention to a smaller subset of states. And so when we say that presidents pay more attention to the country as a whole, that's a relative argument. It's not that they kind of channel every citizen, right, and assign equal weight to him or her, and then, and then figure out what policy ought to look like. There are some forces that train the president's attention in some domains, in some moments, more on competitive states. So mm -hmm. there's some work done on like, you know, presidents will direct more emergency um, disaster relief aid to uh, states that are competitive. And if you got rid of the electoral college, that would make the president even more attentive to national concerns. But our point is that even with the Electoral College, relative to what's going on in Congress, that's the best we've got. 
in our current system. When you think about who's going to channel national uh, national uh, concerns and meet national international problems on on their own terms. You know, one thing worth pointing out about the Electoral College uh, is that it's symbolic of just how archaic our structure of government is. You know, who today would say, hey, Electoral College, great idea. It's not a great idea. You know, it was an idea they had in 1787 when they were not um, going to have ordinary people vote for president, right? right? They let the state legislatures select these elites, electors, right? So that the electors could, in their wisdom, choose a president. And how the electors were divided up across the states was determined in a way that satisfied the small states and the slave states to get them to sign on to the Constitution. Okay, here we are 235 years later and we're stuck with the stupid thing, right? And it, it affects our political system profoundly, right? It's a relic of the past. And this is just one aspect of the Constitution that we're stuck with. We're stuck with the whole thing, right? And so I think it's really important for people to recognize that instead of worshiping the Constitution, which everybody does, you know, we love the Constitution too. But there are downsides to this Constitution. It is antiquated. It does not provide us with a governing structure that we would design today if we could design one. And so we need to take it upon ourselves to modernize the thing. Well, there's another, William, let me start with you on this one. There's another question that's come up from a handful of people, and that is how you would deal with dark money. Money is such a huge consideration in this. It is. Um, and again, the phenomenon that is money is born of um, kind of changes in the electoral system, in part, the rise of primaries lead to the increase in money. Um, there's a reason why lots of that money is channeled towards Congress um, uh, because of its institutional design. But look, the kind of thing that we're describing and the dysfunction that we're characterizing is something that preceded the rise of money. Like we're no fans of money. There's lots of arguments to be had for greater transparency and looking for ways to, you know, overturn Citizens United. Yes, 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 yes. But if you go back and, and look at what's going on with the kinds of the, the ability of the state to meet modern challenges before the rise of money, it wasn't great. It wasn't great at all. An anecdote. Can I? Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, Model Cities Program, Model Cities Program, uh, which was a, 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 a born of a blue ribbon commission in the executive branch in the 1960s, recognizing that the challenges that cities face are profound and complex and multidimensional. And so they came forward and they said, here's what good government looks like, right? We're going to invest a whole bunch of money in a couple of cities, and we're going to learn what actually works. And we're going to take those lessons then on the road and we're going to scale up. Like that's responsible kind of governance, an effort to try to meet complex urban problems on their own terms. Mm -hmm. You hand, they hand that over to Congress. This is before the time of right, money running rampant, before the time of polarized parties. Um, what do they do? Well, each legislator comes forward and says, you know what? I got a city in my district, right? right? I, like, Omaha is a city and we got problems. How about a little money coming our way, right? And and Sacramento, they've got they've got some you know they've got some problems. How about a little money coming there? And so you had all these legislative legislative entrepreneurs coming forward, claiming uh, that they wanted a piece of the pie, which is precisely what they should be doing, right? In advocating for their constituents, and the, what we were left with is over 150 not model cities getting a little bit of money and no learning that follows and no impact. And this is, follows predictably from the institutional design of Congress and the, the procedures that dictate what the legislative process looks like. That that's what you get. And that's what you get before there's money flooding the system and before the parties are polarizing. Now, money and polarized parties exacerbate these issues. I mean, they make, they, we go from bad to worse. But it's not like if we just got rid of the money, we'd be in the clear. Right. Terry, I want you to take on more of the list here. And this is a big one, restricting the president's unilateral powers. And we've seen a lot of examples of why that's urgent. Yeah, well, 
Trump certainly um, shows how unilateral action can be taken to an extreme and threaten our democracy. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, I think that the place to start, though, is by recognizing that we can't simply do away with unilateral action um, because it derives really from the fact that almost all laws in the Constitution itself involve discretion. And they give presidents discretion. And presidents have discretion as managers of the executive branch. Mm -hmm. And it's the exercise of that discretion that is unilateral action. And so it's really up to Congress and the courts to constrain what presidents do. And Congress can do that by writing much more detailed laws. They can, most importantly, really uh, uh, restrict the conditions under which presidents can de declare national emergencies, which Trump has done over and over again, like to impose tariffs on China, right? National emergency, I'm gonna impose tariffs on China. Well, there is no national emergency. The whole thing is a sham. Right? Well, he shouldn't be allowed to do that, the, but the laws are written in such a way that it's difficult to stop him. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. Congress can write the laws uh, much more effectively. Similarly, the courts can step in and overturn these things if they think presidents have gone too far. And so we have to put some stock in uh, pushing Congress and the courts to do these things and in point, uh, pointing to specific ways like in redefining national emergencies, uh, that would actually work. We haven't gotten to the how of any of this, and Robert wants to go to that. Robert asks, do any of your proposals require amendments? If so, how do we get there from here? If not, how do we ensure the changes you propose aren't repealed when progressives who implement your suggestions fall out of favor? William, do you want to tackle that one? Well, I think it you know, we have a whole host of reforms that we're arguing on behalf of that are born of this concern about um, kind of recovering a more effective government, but also attending to the threat of demagoguery. Um, some can be done statutorily. I think changing the 1976 National Emergency Acts can be done statutorily and thereby changing the, the ability of the president to exercise these unilateral powers in ways that can be really destructive. Um, Others would require a constitutional amendment. I think the, while the you know, fast track authority was done through a law, doing something of the type that we have in mind, which is giving the president this power um, across all laws and no longer allowing Congress to give or take away at its, you know, as it so chooses, which Congress now can do when it comes to um, fast track authority, that has to be done through a constitutional amendment. Um, and so look, that's hard. Right, the idea that that's just you know having recognized that that's a good idea, it will naturally and kind of reflexively follow that you know our nation will simply do that is foolhardy. We recognize that this is serious business, um, but we also think you know I mean the effort of this book is not to just kind of say here are the three easy steps that we can do um, in order to set things right. It's to take stock of you know how how deep the pathologies are and how profound the reforms are that need to follow. Mm -hmm. um, and so, look, we, haven't, we don't have many constitutional amendments, but we have quite a few, we, you know, we, have, we have enough in domains where the country recognizes it's not okay any longer for women not to be able to vote, right? And we, that was a whole movement behind that in order to turn that around. Um, well, so when we talk about a sort of a second progressive movement, we part have in mind is a sense that through discussions like this and concerns by a citizenry that look, our, our, our political system is not capable of meeting the kinds of challenges we meet with, that we face, space can open up for the kind of deep change that we need, including constitutional amendments. Another of the controversial statements in the book, Terry, if American democracy is to defeat the populist threat, the Democrats must be the ones to do it. Why are you writing off the Republicans? <laughs> Well, um, the Republican Party is now the organized vehicle for populism in this country. Um, what we've witnessed very recently, but really starting back 
in the 1990s and coming up to the present is the destruction of the traditional Republican Party and its transformation into something else, essentially the Trump Party, a populist party. Uh, this is a party that is ultimately anti-democratic. You know, look at what the Republicans are doing uh, in uh, with voter ID laws, with um, pushing people off uh, the registration rolls, with preventing felons from voting, and on and on and on. Um, they are afraid of democracy, and they are willing to do things that are anti-democratic. They have also been circling the wagons to protect Donald Trump when he's uh, undermined the rule of law, when he's obstructed justice. It doesn't matter what he's done, the Republicans have protected him. And so uh, there's that. Uh, the Republicans are also uh, a party that is extreme ideologically and committed to, uh, say, the free market, uh, uh, at least when it comes to taking on major social problems. They want a smaller government that relies on markets when it does anything, but what that really means is they don't want to have a government that takes on social problems. Mm -hmm. you know? So when it comes to climate change, when it comes to poverty, when it comes to health care, the Republicans don't want an effective government. And in fact, an ineffective government creates anger and uh, uh, creates a larger populist base for them. And so Republicans actually have a stake in a government that doesn't work. The last thing they want is a government that does work because then people would want more of it. Mm -hmm. right? What the Republicans want is a government that is failing because then they can stand up and say, see, you know, you need to support us because we're anti-government, we're anti-system. And so really it's only the Democrats uh, that can be relied upon to try to make government work better. I, there's just no other option at this point. We don't say it because, you know, we love the Democrats and we hate the Republicans. We're political scientists, right? And we're trying to say, this is what the Republican Party is now, and this is what the Democratic Party is now. And if we're going to get an effective government, a government that can really serve the people and solve social problems, it's got to be the Democrats that do that. William, the time is almost up. I'm going to give you the last question. Terry, of course, you're welcome to chime in. Good question from Karen. If Biden wins in November, will you offer up your expertise to the new administration? And do you know whether you have a window to do that? Well, uh, we've written a book um, and we hope that these ideas get into circulation. Um, and we are looking for ways to communicate with people about these ideas because we care deeply about the state of our democracy um, and the ways in which ineffective government have not just directly harmed all kinds of constituents around the country, but have laid the groundwork for this populist uprising, which represents such a threat. And our hope is that if, I mean, look, making, for, making uh, progress in this space, a uh, precondition for doing so is that Biden get elected, but there are no guarantees that then the Democrats will sort of roll up their sleeves and set right to work. There are all kinds of reasons why they may simply attend to, um, you know, taking what were previously conservative policies and trying to make them liberal. And there are all kinds of things that stand in their way from being able to pass systemic comprehensive immigration, excuse me, systemic uh, institutional reform, right? They're, 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 it's hard, hard work. And politically, there's not a robust space for un institutional reform. The Democrats are gonna have to exercise a kind of leadership and to say, no, people, we need to pay attention to this. We hope that they will. We need them to do so. We as a country need them to do so. Um, but there are no guarantees that, all, that, that, that it necessarily will happen. So may they all read the book. All right. And Terry, I'm going to rescind my offer to let you chime in because we are out of time. But I thank you both so much. And the book is definitely worth your time. So please check this out. President's Populism and the Crisis of Democracy. So I love the dog ears. Oh. <laughs> my own private system. William Terry, thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Thank all you. Right. Good night. Tonight's interview was produced by the Kepler Literary Foundation. Thank you for tuning into it. If you are in a position to contribute to keep us producing vibrant events like this, please consider a donation. There is a donate button at keplers.org. If you would like to get in touch with us directly, our contact button is there too. 
look on the site for Refresh the Page, check out our upcoming events. Stay well, be happy, have a good night.